Well, grace, peace, and mercy be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Here we are, right in the middle of our series on failure. Uh, If you've been here with us uh, the last couple weeks, you've heard a couple different subject matters that we've gone over. We begin with the fear of rejection. Uh, Last week, Pastor Mark talked about the fear of failure. Uh, Next week, we're going to get to the subject matter about the fear of losing control. And today, one that's, that's very, very different than those three. The fear of intimacy. It's also known as the sermon that Pastor Mark did not want to preach on, you told me earlier. <laughs> the fear of, of intimacy. What an, what an interesting one for us to be able to talk about uh, in church today. What is that? What picture do you receive in your mind when you hear that word intimacy? What comes up? What do you think about? Most of us probably have a a small box that we lock that into and we conjure up a a certain picture or a certain word frame that would set boundaries on what this subject really looks like for us today. But I think we can actually go a little bit deeper than what our human emotions will kind of hold us to at times. First of all, let's look at the definition of intimacy briefly this morning. Here it is. Intimacy, a close or familiarity of friendship, or number two, something of a personal or private nature. That's something maybe very different than we would normally think about for what intimacy actually is. Intimacy can be a relationship not just between husband and wife, not just a relationship that's, that's physical, but a relationship that's, that's close, a relationship that's near. A relationship between daughter and and mother, between husband and wife, yes, between father and son, between close friends, between people in our congregation. Maybe one that we never think about, a relationship between us and between God. Maybe you've never thought about that before, that your relationship with your heavenly father is one that is intimate. But doesn't that, doesn't that fit? One that is close, one that is familiar, one that is near, one that is private in nature. It really describes our faith. After all, this is how you and I were created. Think about it. It's exactly how God made us from the very beginning of time. From the book of Genesis, we hear the words, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, And the man became a living being. You remember the story of creation. Think about what God did when he formed those great vast forests. He simply spoke them into creation and they were. When God had this small whisper of the sun and the moon, they were there. The galaxies were formed. But not so with you. With you and with me. We have this intimate relationship with God. A God that takes his very own being and forms us to be like him. That he breathes into you exactly who you are. The person that he wants you to be. That happens with no other element in all of creation. Think about how close we are to this God that we hear about today. But something happens as the story goes on. We see that level of intimacy over and over again with the Lord. Look at this phrase today. It says, uh, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Think about that picture. Uh, You live in perfection, the Garden of Eden. Walking with God in the cool of the day. Have you ever heard of something any more close, any more near, any more intimate than this? A God who is not distant, a God who is not far away from us, as the world would tell you, but a God who wants to be close, a God who wants to be near, a God who wants to be intimate. We know where this story goes, though. Just like any good love story that we hear about, there's this fracture that occurs. There's this breakup that happens. 
There's this sin that enters into the world when Adam and Eve choose something else over God. That's how it continues. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Do you remember how how it felt that time when you lied to someone who is close to you and you got found out? Maybe it's when you were younger and it was to your mom or dad. Maybe it was in your adult life. It was somebody that you, that you worked with. Maybe it was something small you hid from your spouse and they found out. Do you remember that feeling of, of guilt? I don't need to ask you. I know how it feels, too. We've all done it. We've all sinned. We've all turned our back on, on others, and we've turned our back even upon God. And it feels horrible when we recognize what we've done. We want to be able to hide. You want to be able to crawl under a rock. You want to be able to get away from the situation, but many times you, you just can't. It's right there in front of your face. How interesting is it that Adam and Eve, when they're in the garden, all of a sudden they're walking with him in the cool of the day, they're in paradise, and then they're hiding from this close, near, intimate being that they are connected with. What makes them do that? Well, Adam says that he was afraid. Why is he afraid? He's afraid because he was naked, he says. Isn't that interesting? Adam and Eve have been naked this entire time. It wasn't something that just happened in that moment when sin entered the world, but it's something that he recognizes in that moment, and so does Eve. They have this moment where they become self-aware, this moment where they become self-conscious, this moment when they become more self-centered. We still suffer from this today in our world. Adam and Eve had no care in the world. They were free to live in this realm of paradise. But then when that self-conscious ability entered into them, when they became more and more selfish, they were afraid of things. So many people are afraid of coming up front and speaking in front of public. So many people are afraid of being able to ask somebody to go out on a date. Uh, Many of us are afraid at times of inviting somebody else to come join us for church. Why is that? Oh, what if they say no? What if they reject me? How will I look? How will I feel? What will that do to, to me? We still suffer from this today. God didn't create us to be these selfish beings that are focused on how we are always going to turn out at the end of the day. He created us to be these beings that are living in a life and relationship of intimacy with one another and again, most importantly, with our God. And so what do we do? How do we change this? Well, we hear within God's word from the author of Hebrews, he says, let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Be confident, God says. Don't be afraid. Don't hide. Approach me with confidence. Come to him and receive that mercy. Receive that grace. Receive that forgiveness that all of us needs. Don't wallow in your guilt. James, the brother of Jesus, says the exact same thing. Come near to God and he will come near to you. And so do we practice this? Are we personal in our relationship that we have with God, with our saviors? And do we encourage this behavior in people around us? I have a friend, his name is Chad. And Chad and I go out to eat once in a while. And when we go out to eat, uh, Chad, either at the beginning or the end of our meal, will ask our waiter or our waitress, he will just tell them, Hey, did you know today is free prayer day? And they'll look at him like he's crazy. And he said, yeah, today is free 
prayer day. And he said, what can I pray for you for? And sure enough, every time the waiter or the waitress, maybe they'll think about it for a minute, but they always come back with a prayer request that they will give to him. And I asked him one time, Chad, you know, has, has anybody ever told you no? No, do not pray for me. And he says, never. No one has ever told me no. People in our world need to hear about the intimate God that we have, that we have the privilege of bringing to them. That we are shrewd in our behavior of figuring out any way we possibly can of taking the great gospel message that has been delivered unto us and unto our church that needs to be taken out into the world. And what does that look like? How is that delivered? Because guess what? People in our world that are not here with us this morning or gathering in another church this morning, they may think differently of the God that you and I know. They may think differently of who we know each other to be because they don't have that intimate relationship with God. If you look at surveys in the world and ask about that word Christian or Christianity, the top phrase that comes up when you survey people of asking, what do you think about when you hear that word? It's judgmental. Is that what we want to be known as? People that are, are judgmental? Because that's not who our God is. That's not who our Savior is. Our God is one of intimacy. A God who wants to be close. A God who wants all people to be saved. That's so key, and we heard that in our text for today, that God wants all people to be able to save. This is the story now, and it's been the story since the beginning of time. Job is one of the earliest books, chronologically, that was ever written for us. And Job writes these words. He says, God is one who shows no partiality to princes and does not favor the rich over the poor, for they are the work of his hands. God, when he forms all people, he doesn't form people that are, are just special to him and others that are outcasts. He forms people as individuals. He forms people, all of us, as his loving children. He forms all of us knowing that he wants to have this great relationship that he offers to us through Christ. It doesn't matter what your physical appearance is. It doesn't matter what your social economic status is. It doesn't matter what your career is or is not. We hear about a God who has no partiality among any of those things. That when he looks at you, all he sees is his child. All he sees is one that he wants to have this relationship with. And so we hear in God's word, it says, Be strong and courageous, Christians. Do the work. Do not be afraid, for the Lord my God is with you. We don't have to fear rejection. We don't have to worry about these things. God has given us Christ for a very specific reason. Think about the God that we serve. Think about that with me for a moment. What are some of the things that God has done that we see over millennia? A God who liberates a group of slaves by opening up the Red Sea so that they can walk on dry ground. A God who takes a, a small sack lunch from a little boy and he feeds thousands of people that are in need. A God that for his first miracle ever turns water into wine. Now I got your attention. <laughs> Think about the, the miracles that God has done over and over and over again. Why? All so that he can be close to his people so that we have the benefit of being close to him. How do we do that? How do we solve that fracture that occurred so long ago? The one that broke this heart, that locked away this gift that God has given to us of perfection. How do we solve that problem? I want to know that. I'm a, I'm a fixer. I want, to, I want to fix this thing. But the bad news is, uh, you don't. You can't. None of us can. 
We're stuck. By our own will, by our own abilities, that gap that was created by sin is a gap that, that we face, that we cannot overcome on our own. You know this, and I know this too, but sometimes we still try to do it. We still try to jump it. We still try to get over it. We still try to pretend like it doesn't exist, but it's there. This barrier between God and man. But what can you do? Well, God's Spirit tells us that we can do one thing in particular. We heard it in our children's message today. That we can trust. Hear those words today from King Solomon, the wisest man who has ever lived. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Trust, one of the most key elements in all relationships. You name the relationship, you take this element of trust from it, and that relationship will degrade. It will break down. Ultimately, it will fail. And so God says to trust in me. You know what that means, right? That we're, that we're open. And trusting somebody or trusting God, we become vulnerable. We lean upon that other person. We put our burdens there with them. They walk with us in this journey of life that we're in. And it's tough sometimes for us to be able to do. Because when King Solomon calls us to be able to do this, there's a, something big that goes around with that. Uh, it's not just in, in some ways or just here or, God, I feel comfortable trusting you in this little area. He says, in, in all your ways, in everything that you do, you need to be able to trust God. Because in that intimate relationship, he promises he will make your paths straight. Still, I know, I know it's, it's difficult. As soon as you walk out of those doors this morning, it's all waiting there for you. All those other distractions, all those other temptations, all those other things to be able to keep this element of intimacy locked away forever. But there's also an answer. An answer that is given to us over and over and over again. Can you remember being in, in middle school and you had a, maybe your first crush on a boy or girl in your class? You wanted to be able to maybe uh, invite them to go to a dance that your school was having, or maybe you wanted to invite them to a, a group date to be able to have everybody play miniature golf together. What did you do? How did you, how did you go about that? It was hard being able to just uh, walk up to that person and ask them that, right? What if I get rejected? What if they say no? I know sometimes I've seen kids when I did youth group, or I remember doing it myself, that you would find somebody else, a friend, they could serve as this go-between, somebody that could take this really sophisticated note that said, will you go out with me? Circle yes or no. <laughs> and they would take that note to that person, and you would wait with sweaty palms for it to be returned to you. Somebody who liked both parties, somebody who had the best interests of everybody in mind, Somebody who wanted to be able to make this relationship work. Somebody who could serve as that mediator between the two. We're told in our scripture today that we have that person, not just for earthly relationships, but most importantly, for a heavenly relationship. The Apostle Paul writes, For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. There it is. There's that answer that we've been looking for, that Adam and Eve have been looking for since the beginning of time. A perfect individual that was delivered unto this earth, that left the comforts of heaven, not to reign as a king, not just to live, but to die for my sins 
and for yours, to rise again three days later so he could proclaim over all things sin, death, and the devil that nothing can hold him back. Not to triumph for himself, not to point at all the cool things that he could do, but to be able to show us that he is the one that is that ultimate key to unlocking the gates of heaven for me and for you. So that that paradise will exist once again. So that we may have that relationship with our Heavenly Father. And so today, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done in your past, no matter where you are at today, no matter what struggles that you face financially, struggles that you face physically, temptations that wait for us in the world, you can slide that piece of paper right over to God through Christ and you can ask Him, Lord, do you love me? Lord, am I forgiven? You don't have to wait for it to return. I can already tell you the answer. The answer is yes, yes, yes.